All right, let's uh, get him started. Um, so we still have uh, two more major topics today, and uh, but I have to acknowledge that none of them are my research areas. So the next part, which is the statistical analysis for rare variants, and this is slides were prepared by Dr. Dongbin Lai from uh, Medical Genetics Department. Um, so basically, the statistical method on the rare variants is a little different from what we talk about the GWAS. In many cases, you can just uh, think of it as a direct association studies with uh, the genotype and then certain level of phenotype. And the rare variants are actually very important. And as you can see, rare variants are responsible for some of the missing heritabilities. Remember when we talk about the GWAS, the major assumption for GWAS is uh, common disease, common variants. And there is a lot of missing heritability issues. And uh, so rare variants usually may have larger effect than the common uh, variants. And that actually made them rare due to the evolution selection. And it's usually in regulatory or exonic regions, so they can be functionally important. And using whole genome or whole exome sequence, you'll be able to identify those. And, uh, but in terms of analysis for rare variants, it become very challenging because we do not have enough statistical power to do that. If you say that there is a variant that is only occurred in 1% of the general population, uh, I mean, 0.1% of the general population, you need a huge amount of sample size to be able to collect enough information to make the conclusion. So it's a very, very difficult problem to solve. And uh, so when we talk about uh, the very variance, you see if people looking for in the past uh, way, in the previous way, like uh, using uh, a GWAS, uh, genome-wide association basis, that is just looking for single loci and uh, association with the phenotype. And uh, large sample size needed to obtain enough statistical power. And uh, for example, if you are testing 100,000 variants and your significance threshold needs to be uh, 10 power minus seven. So it's, a, it's a very, very uh, stringent. They need a, a huge number of sample sizes. So when odds ratio is about two, minor allele frequency, if minor allele frequency is 1%, it's not that rare even. And then you probably need about 5,000 samples to achieve about 80% of power. So this is not a, uh, telling you how to do the calculation, but you can see that if the minor of the frequency is 1%, okay, not that rare, and then significant threshold is a barely genome-wide significant, 10 minus power seven, and the odds ratio is two. That is huge. That means you have twice a likelihood to get this disease if you carry this variant than the one that doesn't. And then you still need over 5,000 samples to, to get to the power. So it's very, very difficult. It's co really cost prohibitive in terms of if you do genome-wide, uh, uh, whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. So therefore, what people do is uh, they will do something called an aggregation test of uh, multiple variants. So this can be a little bit, uh, I mean, from the terminology side, it's uh, sometimes difficult to understand, but the concept is very easy. So meaning that I'm not going to look at each SNP individually, single loci individually. Rather, I'm going to get this gene. And then I just count how many SNPs I observe in this gene, okay? So if in the, in the in the control group. And then in general, I got two SNPs. And in the, in the case group, the disease group, I got 10 SNPs of this particular gene. And then I may do the association in that way, okay? So do not look at individual SNPs, rather than looking at how many SNPs that go into individual gene. So using a gene as a unit, rather than using SNP as a unit. And uh, there are, I know this is probably not a, uh, too much readable, but there are different uh, type of uh, studies, including burden test. Burden test really means uh, exactly what I said. So basically you've got the gene, 
to count the number of snaps in those genes, and then using that measurement to associate with the phenotype. There's adaptive burden task, so meaning that uh, it's a, you, you, your your, you, you do not directly only look at the numbers, rather you give some weights, and this can be an iterative process. And uh, there is a variance component-based analysis. And there is, a, so, so basically you gave, uh, um, you, your weight calculation is going to using a more sophisticated statistical method, but, but the general point is you gave different weights to different SNPs, and then uh, you have a weighted analysis. And combined test and the EC test. So uh, I'm not going to ask you to understand this, but in general, I hope you get the concept that this type of association study is not to look at individual SNPs rather than using a, a, a aggregated uh, a signal to do the association test. So there are multiple. Um, There, there are different uh, algorithms or, or softwares. So those are all softwares that people can use to do this type of test. And you can see that uh, some softwares that they include a more type of test and others are not. So, but, but, but most commonly used are the RV test and the SCAT. These are the two most commonly used tests. And, uh, and the SCAT only do Burden and scat and stack O test, but uh, RV test actually it does a little bit more. So, so those are the things that uh, you, you may uh, look into a little bit. So again, those are the math part we're not going to get into, but I want to have a high level discussion about uh, uh, what are the things need to be considered in terms of the rare variance genetic testing. So the first one is uh, how are we getting the samples, and uh, whether those samples are family samples. The disease variants shared by family members usually have a larger effect. And those are basically you contribute, that, that is related how you collect those samples. And segregation analysis can help to narrow down the list of the candidate variants, okay? So basically you don't look at the individual SNP as a hypothesis, rather you use the gene as a as a, your, your test in base. Family information can be used to improve the quality of the variant calling. And we know there are variant calling issues potentially, but using the family to actually can help us to increase the, the power. And the longer time and the more effort to collect family data. So th those are not uh, easy to come by, those samples. And the larger uh, number of samples needed to be sequenced. So, and uh, so, the real problem for family-based samples are there are fewer choice of the program and software so that taking care of the family structure information into the, the calculation. And uh, in terms of samples other than family samples, there are also unrelated samples. And uh, sample collections will be easier for this. And, uh, and uh, you, you normally you're, you're getting smaller sample size. And uh, many programs or uh, softwares are available for this, uh, this particular unrelated samples. So those are one thing to be considered. Another one is uh, whether we use uh, the public control data. So what that means is uh, when we do GWAS, usually what we do is that there's a, a group of uh, case, meaning there are disease population and the controls. And then we, we do the variant detection and then and do the association studies. But sometimes, because of the sequencing, it's still relatively more expensive. And then sometimes we need a larger sample size. With a limited budget, we cannot possibly to sequence so many cases and then sequence so many control. In some of the cases, what people that do is they only sequence the case, meaning they only sequence the, the disease population they do not sequence control. Rather, they use the public database as their control, okay? Like a gene, solving genomes data, and, uh, and more uh, notably, start people to use the, the information in the dbSNP and, and also using the, uh, ex, the exact database. Remember, I, I talked about there are a database that uh, um, 
aggregate over 60,000 uh, population their, their axon information. So basically, there, this is a, still a very active research area that people try to find out uh, the most uh, uh, accurate way, not uh, doing the control study, only do the case, but using the public data sets as a control to, to do the statistical analysis. And uh, which variants should be included? So when we talk about burden test, and uh, so I mentioned that you got a gene, you count the number of variants that, that fall into that gene. But sometimes uh, not all the variants are created equal, right? Some variants are notably neutral variants. They don't change amino acid sequence. If they do, they don't change uh, the protein structures. And they, they kind of, they seem harmless. In that case, we probably don't want to give them as much weight as uh, the ones that we know is going to cause some trouble. So, so that is uh, for the previous uh, sections so we talked about uh, those uh, different levels of annotation or prediction, and those information can be used into this. Uh, basically, you can uh, give a weight to individual variants, and then that will help you to in increase the statistical power. So, I'm not going to read all these things, but you can see there are functional tools, prediction tools that are being used to figure out which one is potentially more important than the others. So it's uh, not all the variants that need to be uh, included. And uh, how to capture the weighting fact the factors. I mean, different people have different strategy to do that. Each variant have different penetrance levels. And, uh, and this really depends on where they are, what are their predicted uh, biological function, okay? And uh, many of these numbers that are being listed here are actually just uh, pretty arbitrary, that people do this based on their uh, um, uh, experiments. So, so some of them are weighted by predicted function scores, like a CADD score, and that that is going to provide a pretty good way algorithm. So the general idea of this uh, uh, statistical analysis for the rare variance part is uh, it's not to tell you what tests to use or, or things like that. It's really just to tell you that we do not have to consider each variant independently. First one, we cannot do it because we don't have enough large enough sample size to do that. Second, is uh, the way to do that is using a gene as a unit rather than using each individual variant as a unit. Using a gene as a unit, count the number of variants in this gene. Using that as your X to do the association study. And then we don't have to use them equally. We can give them weight. And then, uh, so the more the ones that was uh, more likely to disrupt the molecular functions, and we can give them higher weight and co compare to the others. So those are the information needs to be considered. And if you are, your research leads you into this area, I think uh, and by that time, you probably will have options for that. Okay, any question about this? All right, I assume that that's good. And uh, I assume that I can give questions in the exam about this part, right? Yes. No. You're not going to take the exam. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we talked about that before you came in. <laughs> so, so there is uh, the variant prioritization part, uh, and, uh, and the, there are a bunch of theories related to different algorithms, but there is a, 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 I mean, it's difficult for biology to, biologists to use it, but uh, with the help of implementation, there is a tool called Anovar that you can provide your variants that will help you to annotate all these numbers. I mean, it's basically like a database retrieval part. It requires some level of a Linux operation and things like that. But, but, that, but it, there's a way that you can get the, those impacts. Okay. All right. So 
Now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, another section, which is uh, uh, about uh, microbiology and metagenomics. Um, again, very, very high level, just to give you a general introduction about uh, how to use the next generation sequencing in this important area, okay? So there is a, a, a few vocabulary that uh, people tend to misuse. And I want you to, I want to clarify a little bit. And uh, first is a microbe, and then the microbiota, and then the microbiome, and the metagenomic genome, okay? So what are different words really mean, okay? I suggest you take, to take a, um, I mean, to a careful look at after you, 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 you may want to do the exam, before you do the exam, because there may be multiple choice questions related to that, okay? So basically the microbiome, uh, microbe is uh, the tiny, tiny living organism that are too small to be seen without microscopes such as the bacteria, are algae and, and fungi. So it's a small little box, and those are the microbes. And microbiota is uh, the assemblage of uh, my, microorganisms that reside in or on a defined environment. So basically, it's an uh, out box in the air that is uh, a microbiota. And uh, microbiome uh, refers to the entire habitat that include the, the microbiome species into it and genetic materials and the surrounding environment. So that is the environment is called a microbiome. And the last one is metagenome, is uh, the collection of the genome and the genes from the members of a microbiota. So basically, those little bugs, their genetic materials, collectively they're called a, a metagenome, okay? So, just uh, making sure that uh, you know this concept. Okay. So why do we have to study microbiome or metagenomics? And this is uh, coming from some code, and, uh, and uh, it's microbiomes run the world. It's pretty significant to say. So it's that simple. Although we cannot usually see them, microbes are essential for every part of human life, indeed all life on Earth. Every process in the biosphere is touched by the seemingly endless capacity. So those are clearly some scientific writers that, uh, that they wrote those beautiful words, right? And um, one thing that I mentioned earlier is that the human body is an extended community. It's only 10% of the total 100 trillion of the cells or human cells. The other 90% are all microbiome species, okay? And uh, to study this will help us to understand a lot of stuff that will include uh, the relationship between the life forms, the really the symbiotic, biotic uh, uh, relations between different forms, between us and our environment and other, other things that we interact with us. And uh, it is so very important in the environmental science, actually. For example, the environmental stability and clean up the pollutants. And about chemical transformation of matter essential for life. And uh, if you put it there, and it's a, it's a, it really doesn't mean much. But uh, actually, just to sidetrack, I still have time. So um, I, I listened to one podcast about a year ago and about uh, where do we go after we destroy the earth? And uh, uh, so it's, that's why that NASA is kind of looking at uh, other planet or species or, or so where, where we can go, right? So one um, easy target is the Mars. And uh, we probably see some of the the CO2, the, the, the dry ice, and uh, it's a, it's a, it has some water form so that uh, things can, can be habitable, right? And uh, it's not, it's very, very cold. It doesn't have oxygen and all the other environments that, that we need. So one idea, I mean, people can have a crazy idea, right? Is to warm the Mars. So how to do that is like, if you design a big, like a, glass and then you reflect the, the sun 
just concentrate uh, somehow on the mouth and let it, it melt. So when it melt, I, I, I have no idea whether any, any of these are scientific, right? Oh, I probably shouldn't have to put that on YouTube or whatever. Um, and uh, so, so when it's melt, and uh, basically the CO2 will become the, the, uh, the form that is not a solid form anymore. And then it will surround the Mars, right? So like Earth. And that is actually will protect the Mars. The, the temperature, the environment will become, the temperature is not like now, it's a, a 100 degree or 200 degrees that uh, between the night and days, okay? And uh, so, so that makes the environment much more stable. And, uh, but it's getting better, right? But the problem is we still don't have the oxygen, how to do that. And uh, the scientist is thinking to shape some of the, the bacteria on Earth that they can convert the CO2 into the oxygen and the, into the Mars. So, so basically that's their long-term plan to make this planet uh, habitable by humans, right? But those are non-scientific, those are um, sci-fi, okay? But whatever it is, so they, a lot of our living environment is actually being generated. These both are essential matters to our life are being generated by those uh, microbiome species. Okay. And uh, it produces industrial important uh, chemicals and, uh, and produce useful enzymes. So they're so very much useful using the bacteria to generate a lot of enzymes that human actually Used sometimes in the in, in the uh, our laboratories, and uh, it's a uh, for us uh, in medical school we study this a lot of the more related to human health and disease. So I will give you some example. So how to study metagenomics, and uh, the traditional uh, way to do that is going to need to isolate and culture individual microbes of the interest. So basically, when you get a, a it's a you got a micro microbiota, which is a mixture of a lot of stuff. You basically, your culture you get to only isolate the things you are interested in and then to study those and sequence the genome of one microorganism at a time. So it's, that is traditional way. But metagenomics is really, don't do the isolation. Let's grab the whole thing and then sequence it. So, and then everything we will worry about in the informatics level to do the data analysis. So how to do the metagenomic studies? Okay, this becomes a testable question now. <laughs> the Mars death story is not testable, uh, but this is, okay. So when we talk about uh, bacteria or, or those uh, species, so one thing that uh, a very uh, popular way to study is uh, using the 16S ribosome RNA to do the, to sequence that part. So the, so why this is so special? Because in the, in the uh, polygenic, uh, uh, so, so in this uh, ribosome RNA in the bacteria, so, so these are, you can see this is uh, over 1400 uh, bases long. And the, most of these uh, gray regions, uh, they are invariant regions. So meaning that they are pretty much exactly the same for all the species, all the bacteria, different species. But there are also the ones that are called V1 to V9. Those are a variable regions. So meaning that for most of the species, these regions are different. By telling what the sequences are, we can pretty much identify what are the living organisms or what are the bacterial species are in this. So basically, it relies on using universal primers to amplify the hypervariable regions of 16S, we need to do, I will tell you in the next slide. And it's very cheap and fast to, to do the detection. So basically you do this, right? So some of the studies, the, the microbiota, because of we know the, what the species look like. So basically you, you, you do the PCR reactions from here to here. Basically you amplify this region and only using the Illumina sequencing short arrays, but pair end sequence both these two ends. So basically you will get the V4 and V5 
but this one you can target v2 v3 so there are many different strategies to, to target on uh, which part of the variable you want to target and by doing this you will be able to identify how many v4 are we getting how many v5 are we getting and for v4 there are many different species their sequences are are different so by looking at the composition of that we can identify what are the materials are in this mixture and uh, and what are the quantifications of that so that is a very popular 16 s study it, it doesn't tell you too much it only tells you who what are the bacterial species are in the mixture that you are looking at does that make sense okay and uh, I mean, as you can see, this is kind of is a pretty tedious in terms of doing this. And our short read sequencing may not be the best way, actually. And now there is a trend to use, uh, we have seen a few articles to use the nanopore sequencers to sequence this from the beginning to the end. Forget about amplification. We don't need to do PCR anymore. And don't worry about we are looking for V2, V3 region or V4, V5 region. Let's look at all the nine variable regions because nanopore sequencing, if you recall, they are very long. They can sequence no problem for 1500 bases. They just sequence from the beginning to the end. So that is a, a general trend that people start to look at. I mean, in terms of clinical usage of nanopore sequencing, that is the, probably the first application that people can use. And so, so that is for 16 s study. Another level is uh, to do something called short gun sequencing. I'm not going to read this. You can, you can go back to read it. But the general idea is uh, let's go beyond the 16 s Let's sequence the, all the DNA in this uh, mixture. And then we will figure out what are the, uh, the species in that using the DNA sequences. And uh, so this is called a short gun sequencing. You can imagine this will sequence it require a lot of deeper sequencing and the analysis sometimes become trickier as well, right? So basically you sample every gene from my, microbial populations and provide the genes presented in the microbial result assembled in the individual genomes. This functional study is uh, in, uh, more informative than only the 16 S studies basically that will tell you who are in there because this one also tells you what are the sequences of those uh, microbiome species so basically you can infer the functionalities of those species as well and uh, I'm not going to go through this but in general this is uh, how the shotgun sequencing is do, doing. Basically, you got all this, and then you break it, and you sequence, and do the analysis. That's a, the, the general thing that people look at, OK? So those are the experiment, experimental part, two methods, 16S sequencing and the shotgun sequencing. Shotgun sequencing is sequence everything in there. OK, so now let's look at the data analysis part, OK? For the 16 S sequencing, and uh, so basically there are different, uh, a few different uh, things, so the informatics things that we need to take care of. Okay, the first one is uh, the raw sequencing rates of processing, and this will include uh, the the D multiplexing and uh, quality checking, training the adapters, uh, and the sequencing staging. So it's more like assembly based uh, approaches. And then after doing that, you need to do the taxonomic assignment. So meaning that which for every single species that we have the database of, how many reads are mapped to each individual ones. Okay. And that, that will have a different methods which can become pretty complicated, including the phylogeny-based analysis and non-phylogeny-based analysis. And, uh, and then there is an operational taxonomic uh, uh, unit, it's our OTU. And so basically for this one is you got the sequences but trying to do some functional annotations of these sequences by clustering those uh, units together. It, it can be 
pretty confusing, but uh, but that there's a very established methodology to do that. And after doing that, you are looking for the diversities. There is alpha diversities and beta diversity. So alpha diversity indicates the richness of of the the, the your microbiota you are you are sequencing. So what it really means that is uh, how many different bacterial species are in this mixture. Those are the alpha diversity. The beta diversity is uh, the differences between two populations and whether they are different or not. So some because before and after drug treatment and or before or after you eat something, uh, which I will show you some data that uh, after you have some dietary change, actually the microbiota in your GI tract will be different. Uh, so so it's, a, it's kind of, a, there's a lot of different analysis on that region. So, and then do the sample comparisons using principal component analysis, or clustering analysis, and those things. Again, all these uh, are, I, I just want you to realize that if you do even 16 S studies, there are many different uh, processes they need to go through. Um, and uh, for the metagenomic data analysis, uh, for the shotgun sequencing for this end, uh, it will be even more complicated. That will include uh, you do the metagenomic study, meaning you look at the DNA of this uh, shotgun or you use the RNA molecules of it. So there are all different ways to do the analysis. So it's, uh, it can be pretty complicated. For bioinformatics tools, those are the list of different tools about the uh, Chem and the Mother. These two methods are the most famous ones. So if uh, you say, okay, I find a job to do the information, at the time I did the interview, I told them I can do microbiogenomic uh, analysis, but I have never done that. And then the first assignment they give you is a, a 16S data. And, but now you spend the whole night to read these uh, two hours and to, to see that whether you can run it through and how. But, so this is something that can get you started. Right? Um, and for the shotgun sequencing, uh, there are even more tools that are available and for different level of analysis. So again, I'm not an expert on any of this. Uh, and I just, uh, I actually haven't even heard about most of this as well. So, but there are tools available. So if you are interested in that, uh, hopefully you can have some help. Okay. Um, and then people always show things like this, right? How many, research part articles being published about this uh, area, but you can see with the, the sequencing technology become uh, cheaper and cheaper and more and more available. And really, I mean, all those things go exponentially uh, increasing. So it's a really a good sign of that. So a few slides are talking about the human microbiomes and uh, and again, there is uh, some papers, if you're interested, you can look into it. But what I'm trying to tell you here are simply uh, some higher level conclusions. And uh, NIH had a, a human microbiome project. Okay, and uh, this is, has been uh, several, more than 10 years. And for phase one, and uh, from 2008 to 2012, and they actually they sequenced the, the study, the 242 healthy individuals. So this is very much like a thousand genomes project, which we recruit a healthy individuals, forget about disease, right? And let's see what are the background of the healthy individuals in terms of their microbiome species. And they have females and uh, males and females. And uh, they look at, for each one, they look at multiple body sizes. This is very different. At, at this level, it becomes very different from the, the, the human gene, uh, Southern Genomes Project, which our DNA throughout the body is the same. For here, it's more like the RNA level. So for different uh, area in our body, the, the community is very different. So they look at 15 for male and 18 for females. 
and, uh, and each individual, so this is also dynamics. It's not only spatial, so my body is different. It's uh, at a different, uh, before, after taking the bath, I guess, it would be different as well. So they, each individual have multiple visits as well. And they also have the clinical uh, metadata of these individuals. So you can see that these are the size of being, uh, uh, being selected to do the, the uh, metagenomic analysis. So the, the general goal of this uh, phase one uh, is really to generate a, a reference genome as a healthy microbiome species and uh, characterize uh, the diverse collection of uh, microorganisms that reside in or on, on or in human, healthy human bodies. So what is uh, the normal baseline of a uh, uh, human body? And determine the relationship between human health and disease and changes in human. So after we got in sick and uh, how that will change our microbiome uh, community as well. And, uh, and another important thing is to develop uh, many tools or standard, like uh, in, a, in a regular genome sequencing, we have this VCF or we have this VAM uh, uh, files, and those are standard formats that are being developed. So those are very, very important. So uh, the, the rest of the slides are just a very high level of summary. So we can see that uh, the biographic richness uh, and actually, I don't know why, why it's projected here become unreadable, but uh, each individual line uh, really corresponding to each body size. And then you can see the number of uh, uh, genera being identified and you can see different sites have different, uh, I would say this is alpha diversity of different body sites. Uh, and then they look at uh, the structural functions. So you can see that uh, these are being grouped by different sites that are being collected. So you can see the GI tract, uh, they basically cluster together and uh, uh, genitals and skin and the oral, so they are kind of have different clusters, which is uh, expected because different body sites will have different uh, microbiome species uh, there. And, uh, and that there's another concept is called the personal microbiome. So, so you can see those are uh, for, for each individual uh, size. And those are many different individuals. So you can see that this, this will be uh, different, have a lot of diversity across different individuals as well. I mean, those are all expected. And actually you can see those are uh, have a different uh, uh, St. Louis or Houston. I mean, we even know it, it, it will be different, right? Houston will be much humid, so they may have some of the species is a, is a little different. And uh, so, so this is also that you can see this is from pathway level or function level to look at the sequence analysis of different uh, sites and how that will relate to the different biological functions of different organs. So I have heard that um, not only that the bacteria help us to digest the food. And there is a lot of move on about the, the pharmacogenomics related to microbiomes. And because the, there are, uh, I know that some of the people from Dr. Longley's group that they studied this pharmacogenomics, some of the microbiome species, when we take drugs, I mean, we know that our liver or kidney will help us to metabolize the drugs. And, uh, but sometimes some of the microbiome species will have the ability to metabolize the drug as well. So, so sometimes it's not only the coming from our own organs, but those uh, bugs will help us to do that as well. So it's a very, very fascinating area. Um, and uh, but you can see that uh, this uh, human microbiome colonization start at birth. So I, I, I think I have to read this. This is uh, important. This, so, so this is uh, from birth and to two to three years old. And, uh, and here is a, uh, it's not, it's not a readable, but one of them is uh, the internal uh, diversity. One is the outside diversity. So you can see that one is becoming more and more uh, diverse, the other one become more and more uniform. So it's, a, it's very, very interesting. So 
and um, and uh, there, there are a lot of things. It's a first uh, batch of studies. It's really just a global characterization and uh, how how this thing work and uh, what are the distributions. So you can see that uh, rapid microbiome responses to dietary changes, and uh, uh, if this one changed to plant-based diet become vegetarian, so you can see the GI microbiome really start to change very rapidly in a in couple of days. And uh, this, uh, we can just read that we need only read the, the article names. The initial state of the human gut microbiome determines its reshaping by antibiotics. So if we, we take a lot of antibiotics, and uh, that potentially can change uh, the, uh, the, the microbiomes in our GI tract as well. The skin, there's a pathogen infections. The human skin microbiome associated with outcomes of and uh, is influenced by bacterial infections. And this is actually study coming from Dr. Stan Benola, and uh, which is uh, in our school, the uh, the chair of uh, uh, immunology and microbiology. Um, and uh, there are related to. Uh, so, so when our microbiome being disrupted, and sometimes it will be uh, related to many different diseases, uh, and include, uh, I really cannot read this anymore. Uh, the, so, so obesity and uh, this uh, uh, atrophy and uh, even autism, spec autism spectrum disorder, and uh, this uh, is also somehow related to the. Uh, disruption of a bi microbiome species. And uh, this one tells you that uh, uh, in related to the type 1 diabetes, and this one is related to the uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and uh, the relationship of uh, microbiome with cancer, there are multiple studies suggesting the evidence of that, and there's more evidence. <laughs> of different cancers. But the general idea is uh, this is uh, something It's an important part of our body, although it's not our genome. If they are sick, we are really sick. Uh, and um, so this, uh, and people also start to introduce the idea of uh, microbiome-based therapies. And, uh, and uh, you probably will feel a little bit uh, uh, Turning your stomach if you read this a little bit deeper, uh, that will include uh, the, the, the fecal microbiota transplantation and, uh, and those type of uh, treatment, in terms, especially in terms of uh, uh, GI tract related disorders. But if you look at this, uh, uh, the history of this uh, uh, is uh, in the fourth century in China, people started to do this, uh, which is uh, amazing. And, but it's uh, scientifically, uh, probably uh, in the 1950s, people start to more, be more systematically uh, do this. I, I, I remember I, I heard about one of the NPR reports about this, and they kind of uh, uh, systematically introduced that this kind of uh, thesis uh, uh, transplantation. Sometimes it's uh, um, turning your stomach a little bit, but that is a useful uh, treatment. And uh, uh, metagenomic sequencing in pathogen detections. And uh, so we, we also talk about, remember, we want to talk about nanopore sequencers and when we need to go to the, the Africa or different uh, part of the world and how that will in influence uh, uh, all this. So, so uh, these are the workflows, and I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see the general idea is you got the samples. And then either using the Illumina sequencing, and here is actually specifically talking about the, using the Oxford nanopore longer sequencing because we don't need that to be that accurate. Bottom line is that we want to know who is there and what are their general function is. So if there are a lot of uh, uh, sequencing errors, that is not a problem. Uh, in summary, that advances in next generation sequencing technology enables us to structure study structure and function of a microbiome in a culture independent manner. Our uh, microbiome plays a critical role in healthy and wellness, in our health and wellness. If uh, they are sick, we are sick. 
and uh, and it's uh, basically present a very important opportunity for disease diagnosis as well as treatment. So this becomes a really, really uh, interesting area. And, uh, and one of the, the things that uh, uh, I think I mentioned that in the first lecture is in terms of the commercialization opportunities, if we only sequence our genomic DNA sequence, they do not change, right? Yeah, unless, it, I mean, for cancer study, there will be different things, but uh, in general, they don't change. But our microbiomes, they change very rapidly before after you're sick, before after you, you have any disturbance. So that can, it, it, that justifies the way that you do multiple sequencing, many times the sequencing through, uh, throughout your, your life course. And that is something the sequencing manufacturers will be very happy about. Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, they gain the market attractions. All right, so I think that's all I want to talk about. Let's take another five minutes break and then Sean, you'll be on, okay? <laughs>